magnetic field originated and what was its early intensity. And um, we've been working on this for a long time. Uh, John mentioned my 2012 filter. trip. Actually, my first one is in 2001 as a graduate student. My first NSF proposal actually in 2003 was on this topic. Um, and a lot of different people have contributed to this, and it's not time, they don't have nearly enough time to credit everyone, but everyone here has really done, has a unique role in this project, and it's not even a complete list. So a few of these people in the audience, Rob Coe, my new graduate student, Kawe Borlina, Nick Swanson Heisel, um, and uh, Beth Ann from uh, uh, UCLA, who's working on the microprobe, Beth Ann Bell. And, uh, and this is getting to be an old joke, because I showed this talk already once at AGU, a person of this, but if you want to know about the GOAT, Ask me afterwards. Um, anyway, uh, so why do you, uh, why do we want to do this? So hopefully John convinced you in the morning, if you didn't need to convince you already, why we might want to do this. One of the reasons, of course, is related to the early Earth's atmosphere. So before the Earth's magnetic field was present, um, the solar wind electric and magnetic field impinged directly on the ionosphere, potentially stripping off large quantities of volatiles by a non-thermal mechanism. So Understanding the history of the dynamo has important implications for the earlier volatile budget, for example, in the oxidation state. Not to mention all this, this uh, core flow issue, heat flow issues that we've talked about. Okay, so what do we know? Um, of course, going back to the, the well, best well-preserved rock record of three and a half billion, um, there seems to be evidence for a strong <coughs> field. Maybe we don't quite know exactly what the, the, the value is, but it seems to be roughly Earth's strength. These are single crystal paleointensity studies from the Rochester group here. Um, and the whole point, of course, is the Earth is four and a half billion years old. There's a huge gap, and the jack field zircons <laughs> fill almost in that entire gap all the way back to 4.4 billion. Now there's actually another outcrop, a few outcrops where Hadean zircons have been found in Western Australia that also fill in this region. So this allows us to potentially figure out this missing billion years. Um, and uh, as you heard this morning, in 2015, the Rochester group reported single crystal paleointensity studies. Each of these points is one of their, their paleointensities. Um, and argued that, uh, that the, the dynamo extended all the way back to 4.2 billion. Maybe it was a little bit weaker than the present day. So I wanted to say um, the Rochester group deserves a huge amount of credit for attacking this extremely difficult problem. Um, and also for, in general, pioneering the single crystal uh, approach over the last two decades. And so. Uh, that, that's something that, that I, that I want to make clear is that there's a, there, there've been some really important contributions here. However, there are some issues with this that I think um, we, that uh, given how important this, this uh, topic is, that should be addressed. The first thing is how do you determine the age of these paleontensities? So uh, broadly speaking, they, they sign these ages based on the uranium lead ages of the zircons. However, it's well established that uranium lead ages can be uh, much older than magnetization ages. I mean, you have zircons that survive being in a magma, for example, right? So these, these paleointensities could be hundreds of millions or even billions of years younger than shown here. Secondly, these are super analytically difficult experiments. Um, certainly the most difficult things I've ever attempted. And I think given that, it's important that other groups try to do this independently and see if they can get similar results. Okay, so that's where we're at. Uh, the talk kind of addresses those two issues in, in those two or in that order. So first about unremagnetized, how do we find unremagnetized zircons? And then um, what's what do what the what do their magnetic data look like? So let's talk about the first part. So zircon, of course, is not ferromagnetic, but the idea of, of course is that it has could have ferromagnetic inclusions, and if they're primary, they might be say something like magnetite, like we've seen younger zircons. And the whole point here is that that can be readily remagnetized, either by, by chemical remagnetization, by aqueous alteration, for example. The, the original minerals could be destroyed. Um, there could be new minerals deposited in the voids. Or, and this is the major subject of this talk, they could be thermally remagnetized. Um, both of these are major issues, but I just don't have time to talk about both things. So I'm going to focus mainly on the thermal remagnetization. Okay, so before we talk about the zircons, let's just talk about the rocks that are in. I have actually, I don't know if you guys have seen this thing. This is for the people online, but I'm going to be giving them a sample of the rock. Uh, this is actually the Jack Hills uh, GD zircon buried post conglomerate um, from Western Australia. And, you know, just take a look at it, you'll see it's, it's not in the best shape. Uh, you, you'll see that the, the inhabitants of the conglomerate and the, the, the stretch. And um, the nice thing about the conglomerate, of course, is that it's conductible to a conglomerate. Anyway, it's called the test. There's maybe 
hundreds of zircons per kilogram in that particular sample, for example. Okay, so this is something that, that uh, John and I agree on, um, and it's an important thing, which is that, yes, the rocks have been exposed to up, upper green schist bases, but multiple mineral thermometers, including some of the study by our own group, indicate so monazite xenotime thermometry, titanium and quartz thermometry, what we our new technique called lithium and zircon geospedometry, these are giving peak metamorphic temperatures, equivalent one hour blocking temperatures, somewhere around 540 degrees Celsius. So this is after the rocks were laid down at three billion years ago. So it seems, and we agree on this, that at least in terms of thermal remagnetization, the rocks have barely escaped being completely thermally remagnetized since three billion years ago. There's maybe a few tens of degrees of blocking temperature. Of course, that doesn't tell us about the aqueous alteration history of the rocks. But it means, if, if I didn't think that, I would have quit doing this project a long time ago. Okay, so let's see if we get, it's natural for, to first start studying these rocks to see what their remagnetization history is before you start talking about the zircons. Because one of the big challenges of this project is it's obvious is that these are sitting in really old rocks, three billion years, which have been through quite a history, and then we're missing up to 1.4 billion years of geologic history. We have essentially no geologic context. So let's worry about that bigger problem later. Let's first just look at the remagnetization history of the rocks. Okay, so this is something uh, that, that John showed a little bit this morning, and I think this is one of the things I was complaining about that he, I believe he, he misrepresented pretty significantly. So the reason we're doing this is uh, we want to see whether we can confirm that peak unblocking temperature and we can want to see whether we can see if there's been aqueous remagnetization. So it's worth doing these tests, even though we can accept those mineral thermometers. So I'm going to start with a dike. So 1.1 billion years ago, the Jack Hills and all of Western Australia, upper northern Western Australia, was intruded by a large igneous province called the Warakurn, a large igneous province. This particular dike is about 100 meters or so from the Hadean zircon bearing outcrop. And here's its magnetization direction. That's a mean. Um, we conducted 12 field tests around the uh, Jack Hills Hadean Zerka. Bold test, conglomerate test on that block you see with you, and big contacts that's associated with this dike. So uh, to, sum, what, what, to summarize this, and this is really the most important point before I show you directions, all of those tests failed or were inconclusive. And this involves at least a, nearly an order of magnitude more specimens than the other group has, has, has measured. So it's quite a bit of, quite a bit of measurements. Now let's just talk about how they failed. So here are the three big contact tests. They were, they, this is quartzitic country rock out to greater than three dike radii, and the mean direction is essentially within the error of the dike. Then um, if you go uh, 800 meters away from the dike in country rock, this is actually quite close to John's cobbles. You also find it's basically in the dike direction. If you go three kilometers away and you measure a monzo granite, formed at 2.6 billion, you get basically the same direction. Then if you do a fold test, one of our told tests was inconclusive, the other one failed, but it's, it's, the data are pretty scattered. That scattered mean with the large alpha 95, which you have right to complain about, is broadly in this direction. And then there's the three conglomerate tests directly on the block that you're, that's being passed around in one like it, that uh, John showed. Now those, of course, are fairly scattered as well, but all three of those failed, and that's the important point. Every one of these tests failed, or was inconclusive. Now, when, the, when was this remagnetization event that, 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 that caused these tests to fail? That's a really a second order issue. It must have been less than three billion years ago. Um, if you take the mean of all of those different sites, now this is much more than the three means that John showed you. This is all of those different sites, except for the dike you get this blue star. It, it takes into account the dike, and it also is in the same, uh, takes into account the, it, it's within its 95% confidence interval of the mean wire kernel large igneous province direction. So this, there's a substantial evidence for remagnetization. Now, there's an important caveat here, which is that when we demagnetize these, these samples in the lab, they have peak unblocking temperatures largely around 330C. Some samples get up to about 500, but most of them are, are completely demagnetized by 330C. And this is not because we can't detect them. Even when they're dead, their orders of magnitude, they're uh, like uh, two, two to three orders of magnitude above the noise limit of our magnetometer. 
So we cannot say anything about the thermal history of these rocks above 330 to 500 C. So just because all of these fail does not mean that the rocks have been completely remagnetized. In fact, this is consistent with the, um, the metamorphic temperatures that I quoted earlier. However, we do see no evidence of those high, that high unblocking temperature fraction that passes the multiple conglomerate test that John, that, that John uh, reported. And why that is, given that we're basically measuring very similar samples, it remains a mystery, which is why I was asking for us to see if we can exchange samples to resolve this. All right, so that's where we, um, that's all I'm going to say about the rocks, mainly because even though there's this big disagreement in terms of our measurements, and it really is a measurement disagreement, um, it's a sideshow because what we really care about is the zircons. And even if, you, if we found that all of these tests failed, certainly it doesn't give you great confidence in this, but it doesn't rule out completely that a single crystal, like Josh was saying, might be armored against this kind of aqueous alteration. All right, so let's talk about the zircons. Just a little bit about the uranium lead. John showed this earlier. I just want to make the point that, yes, uranium lead ages do not date magnetization simply because lead is a very low diffusivity in, in zircon. These are time temperature conditions to produce uh, lead loss as a fraction of the total lead in the zircon. And what you see here is that even heating it to 800 C for 10 million years essentially um, leads to essentially no lead diffusion, which would be detectable with typical methods. So that's, of course, well below the magnetite Curie temperature. So the, the, the real challenge here is we have things that are super old. We're missing their 1.4 billion years rock record. And that was a time when maybe Earth was the most unpleasant place that you could possibly be if you were a rock. If, if, if all the times you might want to be a rock on the surface of the Earth, it might be during the Higgin, for example. So the, the surface of the Earth was being hit by impacts, and, and uh, who knows what the, um, how many you know, granulite phases, metamorphic events these things went through. I mean, maybe not, but who knows? So how do you figure out the thermal history of a grain when we have no rock record? So we uh, thought about this for a while, and only about five or six years ago, um, Bruce Watson visited me at MIT and we were discussing this and, and he suggested um, looking at the lithium data. So lithium, um, so zircons, here's an example of the zircon shown in purple. When they grow, they become, they tend to incorporate trace elements like rare earth elements and they become radially zoned in these elements. An example of a common rare earth, a common um, trace element is lithium. And I've shown some lithium bands here, which are commonly very sharp when the zircon grows. And so what Dustin Trail did is he grew zircons in the laboratory and also um, took natural zircons and bathed them in a lithium-rich fluid and measured the diffusivity of lithium in zircon. And what he found is that lithium has 13 orders of magnitude higher diffusivity than the lead at 500 degrees Celsius. It's an extremely mobile trace element. So just a little bit of heating will uh, soften this profile. And we, call, we quantify that softening in a quantity we call the profile length. Okay, so taking uh, Dustin's um, time temperate uh, diffusivity calculations, we can calculate a um, time, time temperature conditions required to produce a given amount of, a given uh, profile length. And that's what we present in this 2016 paper. So here's profile length versus duration and for given temperature, for different temperature events. So you can see a higher temperature event produces more um, profile, a thicker profile, for example. All right, so what can we accept for heating? Well, we don't want it heated to the Curie point, obviously, um, but we need it to be below that so that we can actually do a proper paleo intensity experiment. So let's say we can accept 530C as the peak uh, uh, magnetization, remagnetization temperature that the zircons can have experienced. So uh, if we can accept that the sort of minimum time scale for a uh, uh, regional scale metamorphic event is somewhere between 0.1 and 1 million years. Then this gives us a, a profile length constraint that we should be looking for zircons that are less than 15 to 5 micron uh, profile lengths and lower. Okay, so the question is, do these exist? So this is the example we put in the paper. Here's a 4.03 billion year old zircon with uh, a primary growth banding here. This is actually, um, uh, cathodal luminesc luminescence imaging, mainly showing dysprosium. If you zoom in on that and you make a, use the UCLA ion microprobe uh, and you, you measure the lithium ion concentration, you basically see this image on the right. And what you can see is that banding is, is five microns in scale in the smallest area. So um, 
under assuming this diffusivity uh, that we've measured in the laboratory is applicable, this would exclude 530C 0.1 million year of thermal events since the Hadean. And actually, I forgot to mention one important caveat. So there's another group who's been measuring the diffusivity of uh, lithium in zircons, and they. They have some preliminary data. We're going to, I haven't actually seen the details yet, but they've suggested that under, maybe under certain circumstances with certain zircon uh, compositions, the diffusivity of lithium may be uh, lower than we measured in our experiments. So we're trying to understand that. So the point is this is a new technique, and it still remains to be tested. Um, but I think it's promising. And for the, really, for the first time, allows us to even think about how we might actually establish the thermal history of the zircon, at least the thermal ionization history. Another thing we'd like to do is actually apply it to young samples whose metamorphic histories we know is a way of testing it. Okay, so for every zircon like that, I can show you many, many more zircons like this. So here again, a CL image on the left with nice banding. But if you take lithium ion images, you see very soft lithium banding. So we cannot exclude, in this case, and many like it, complete thermal remagnetization, essentially, despite it being otherwise a beautiful looking zircon. All right, so that's the approach we're using. Um, now let me just show you some initial results, and this is, this is just the beginning of the magnetic data. Okay, so let me just start by saying this is super hard, um, and there's three reasons why. One, these things are really weakly magnetic. So basically they start out at the, the strongest ones are 10 to the minus 12 ampermeters squared. The most, the weakest ones are 10 to the minus 15 ampermeters squared. So just figuring out how you can detect these things um, gave us a lot of trouble. So I think finally we have a bunch of magnetometers now that are under development or being, have been developed, one of them being the SWIN microscope, and they can allow you to access this range. Um, I believe there's other magnetometers under development, like the SURF magnetometer, and the upper end of this range, um, John's small bore magnetometer can access. Okay, so we described our approach in our 2016 GQ paper. So we're able, if we map the magnetic field of an unresolved source, it's a dipole, and you can uniquely recover the net moment from that. And we showed how samples that we've measured with the SWID microscope give essentially the same results as 2G measurements when they're sufficiently strong to be measured. Okay, once you solve that, then you have to deal with contamination. So basically, you think fields like uranium lead have been in this situation for a long time where they are basically not limited by measurements, by measurement sensitivity, but they're limited by contamination. Once you're down at these fields, at these moments, you're basically, your biggest problem, I think, is contamination. We, even preparing these samples in a clean lab, we have to be ultra careful to, to maintain their cleanliness so we can see that, the, that they can get, become contaminated. I mean, not to mention them sitting in the dirt for four billion years before they came to us. So the contamination issue is huge. As an example of that, we cannot find an adhesive that's thermally stable that um, is essentially less magnetic than these zircons. So we have basically given up using an adhesive to mount them onto something. So we had to develop a new technique where we drilled out quartz mounts and then stuffed them with ultra quartz powder with the zircon inside. That's described in Roger Boo's paper in 2016. Finally, there's the recording limit that John mentioned. So once you start getting down to these these field these moment sensitivities, you have to, you start to worry about. This is also something John was Josh was pointing out. That if you have enough grains to even have a statistically meaningful record of the geomagnetic field. So interestingly enough, there are two of us that sort of thinking about this at the same time. Bern et al. published the paper first, and then ours came out a few months later. And actually, interestingly, also there was a kind of obscure paper by Joe in the proceedings of something or other in 1981. Um, that also looked at the di directional aspects of this. So what's kind of cool about this is we're all sort of working on, we knew about the, the Kirschwing paper, but you know our approaches are very different. You'll see if you read these papers. We all basically agree that for a 50 microtesla roughly strength field, you shouldn't try to do Pelham intensity experiments on NRM that starts out to below somewhere between 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 15. Once you get in that range, you should expect that you're, you're, you're gonna be 20 degrees off or so in direction and 20% or more often paleo intensity is kind of a rough number, so. Okay, so that's kind of a rough guide. So th what that also says is that there's no reason to build more sensitive magnetometers than we have now. We've basically accessed uh, all the meaningful um, moment ranges that you could do paleomagnetism with, with the latest generation of magnetic magnetometers. Okay, so the question then is, 
there's two questions we want to address before we started on the jackal zircons. Can zircons even record paleo intensity? A. Um, and B. Can we actually do? It? Can we actually successfully get those records in our lab? Um, and so to address that question, those two questions, we started to measure a young zircon set of zircons from the Bishop Tuff. So formed only 770,000 years ago. We know there was a geomagnetic field building. We know its strength. Jeff Gee and his group, um, Julie, uh, um, actually did a bulk rock paleo intensity study on the on the Bishop Tuff. And so they were kind enough to, sh to share with us um, their outcrop locations, and we went and got samples. And um, we, they gave us an opportunity to actually compare our paleo intensities to, to Josh and Julie's um, bulk rock paleo intensities. So here are the eight zircons that passed the, our quality criteria, and these are not going to be as beautiful um, paleo intensity data as you would expect from a young basalt, because there's lots of limitations here. Um, if we exclude the ones with maghemite, we get this mean, and it's basically the same as what they got from their bulk samples. So this suggests that although these experiments are hard, the data are a little noisy, um, we can, you know, record, we can recover paleo intensities from zircons that are meaningful, and zircons can recover, and in principle can record those themselves. All right, so let's finally get to the jackal zircons. So we're just at the beginning because we didn't want to start doing this until we figured out everything else. So here's an example of a Tellier Tellier paleo intensity. I'm just showing you the thermal demagnetization now of a jackal zircon and using the squid microscope. So what we're doing is we're mapping the magnetic field, we're fitting a dipole moment to it, and then we're building a Ziderfeld diagram. So this is not like the standard thing that you're used to do. So what you can see is after removal of a overprint of somewhere between 200 or so degrees Celsius, it kind of noisily trends to the origin and it's dead by about 520. So here's, a, here's an RI diagram for that. Um, the PTRM check shown in blue do pretty well up to 520, coming back from 550, and then beyond that, all hell breaks loose. I've actually cut off this diagram. They, out there, they're, they, it, gets, it gets really magnetic. So basically what we can see is that, that we can get decent paleo intensity um, PTRM checks up to 520. We fit a um, slope to that, we get about 24 microtesla. Okay, so so far, and we've, we've, we're just starting this. Um, we've seen basically for all zircons that are sufficiently magnetic, that we see basically the same behavior. So, and this here's an example of three of them. Um, this is now just showing the moment normalized to the NRM at room temperature as a function of temperature during the paleo intensity experiment. And I've cut off the um, temperature axis at 300 so we can, so we can zoom so we can zoom in, I can zoom in on the high is that basically these, these three samples are demagnetized by somewhere between 520 and 550. So unfortunately, that is lower than the, what we estimate is the peak uh, one hour blacking temperature equivalent for the metamorphic event that affected the rocks after three billion. So we cannot use that remnants to infer anything about the, the dynamo prior to deposition from these zircons. Crucially, they alter all three of them above that temperature. So this, this, this magnetization decay does not appear to be from laboratory alteration. It appears to be unblocked. Also, it's way above our noise limit. So they go wild. Here's our noise limit shown on the left, um, magnified by a factor of 10. So this is not because we can't detect them below, above that temperature. So this is very different from what the Rochester group reported in 2015, which was highly stable magnetization, blocked all the way up to essentially the 580, passing, mostly passing PTRM checks. So we're hoping to find the same data as we get further along in this process. All right, so look where we are right now. So I'm gonna start with the bad and then end on the good. The bad is that Uranium lead ages do not e equal magnetization ages in their upper limits only. Secondly, we have not been able to identify any zircons yet that we, know we could possibly record at ADM done. But we just started, and so I don't want to make too big of a deal at that point. Something I haven't had any chance at all to describe this because I don't have time is that the chemical remagnetization problem is enormous. So Beth Ann, who's in the audience, did a study of iron oxides in, in the Jack Kill zircon. So she found that of all zircons with iron oxides, only 8% had iron oxides not associated with cracks, voids, or healed, healed cracks. 
So most of the iron oxides and most of the zircons are almost certainly secondary, and we see a lot of evidence for that. That doesn't mean all of them are, it just means it's a small fraction. So I would say, my opinion is that there is not robust evidence for a giant dynamo before three and a half billion. I would also say that uh, you should go through the data yourself and make up your own mind. I'm sure you would do that anyway, but you know, just that's the only way we're going to resolve this is as a community. It's not going to be me or John telling you what we think the answer is. Okay, so the good. The good is that um, we have a technique, we believe, with some caveats that can actually allow us to establish the thermal remagnetization history of the zircon going all the way back to the Hadean, which is kind of a mind-blowing idea. Um, we, we showed that zircons can recover panel intensities, can record panel intensities accurately. As far as I know, that's the first demonstration that zircons can do that. And we've also shown that we can recover those paleo intensities in the lab. And we have a lot more zircons to measure before we quit. So let me just end by saying uh, I want to thank NSF um, for this, for supporting us to do this. They recently gave us an Inspire grant to pursue this work. And I think it's really important, uh, it's always important that ver verification occurs, of course, in science, but particularly for this super hard problem. So as we discussed this morning, I think one obvious thing to do here is for us to exchange at least bulk rock samples to start, maybe eventually zircons. Um, what this grant allows us to do is a few important things, and it's relevant to this, com this uh, conference. First, it supports visitors to MIT and Harvard to measure using our unique magnetometers. So because these samples are out of reach of some instruments, or most instruments, you need some, have some kind of special sensitivity magnetometers to do this. We don't want, the only way people are ever going to believe our results is if other people come and make their own measurements. And that also goes for the quantum, quantum diamond microscope, which I haven't talked about, but which affords ultra high sensitivity, mag, high sensitivity uh, magnetic imaging of zircons. Um, it also supports an open archive of our measured data sets. For the last five years ago or so, we've been posting our data, our demagnetization data as online supplemental material. I'm totally convinced now that it needs to go into magic, and so I'm staying here for a few days to make sure this happened. And starting this year, all of our data will go into magic. And finally, um, we are creating a open archive of our measured and pristine zircon samples. So you can come and take a look at the samples we measured and make up your own mind. You can also request pristine samples from our archive to make your own measurements. So thank you to NSF for uh, supporting this, and thanks for uh, listening. Appreciate it.